Welcome to Mom's Writers Club. I'm Jessica. And I'm Sarah. And today we have a very special guest. Her name is Casey Dombowski. Casey is the author of When We're 30, which won the Contemporary Romance Writers Stiletto Award for Unpublished Women's Fiction. She is a working writer and a mom. By day, she works in corporate market communications, and at night, she spends quality time with her family. She writes love stories and stories that focus on the intricacies of relationships. She also has an MFA, which we're going to kind of start with. Welcome, Casey. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we're excited to have you here. So we'd love to hear just a little bit about your decision to get an MFA and your thoughts on it and whatever you have to say about it. And then we have some questions for you. Sure. Uh, well, I have been writing forever, but in my head as like this, like, so, you know, 17 year old in high school, I was like, I can't study writing. Like I need to study something that's going to like, give me a real like career. <laughs> and, um, so I went into journalism and I was like trying to decide what I wanted to do for my master's while I was in college. And I was like, no, I'm going to like, go get an MFA. This is going to be like my my degree for me and I'm going to take this time and I'm going to go get one and study writing because I literally like have not let myself do this my whole life I don't know why <laughs> um so I um applied to a bunch of MFA programs uh and I got into Adelphi Universities um which was pretty new at the time I think I was like the third graduating class um and it was just it was great it was in person full time so I had two jobs so I was getting my MFA and Adelphi was about an hour from where I lived wow. so I don't know how I wrote a book <laughs> <laughs> um, and survived and and uh, did all of that but yeah I mean it was it was a, a great experience and I kept telling myself like after I get my MFA I'll go to law school like I'll just you know I'll do something else and then I got a full-time job and it all kind of worked itself out that's great that's so interesting that you thought about it like the degree that fulfills expectations and then the degree for me and then you were ready to go into that iteration again like well now I should get a degree that you know fulfills expectations <laughs> exactly. but you didn't wind up going to law school I didn't, you know, and it's funny because I feel like uh, there's all these points in my life where I was like, maybe I'll do pre-law, maybe I'll go to law school, and I've always done something else, so maybe, you know, when I'm a, a best-selling author and I can just take the time, I'll go to law school. One day. Oh, it's so funny. I've thought so many times <laughs> about, like, all the careers that I want to have that seem so interesting, and law is definitely one of them. I feel like that's almost the new normal for so long people were expected to have one career, and now it's like each decade we're going to just try out a new one. For your MFA, was there a specific focus? I did my MFA in fiction. That was, you know, my focus. There's also, they also have a poetry uh, line and creative nonfiction. Okay. And playwriting. But yeah, I, I did it for fiction. So I took mostly fiction workshops um, and, you know, literature classes and such. Was it highly focused on literary fiction? I know that there are a few programs out there that focus more on commercial fiction, and I've kind of, uh, I've heard people preferring one or the other. Uh, yeah, so my program was definitely more focused on literary fiction. Um, Which I think is most of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are a couple now that are like for commercial fiction, but a lot of them are, are literary focused. Mm -hmm. Got it. How did that work into what you currently write? Because you are, are you, is your book a rom-com? It is a rom-com, yes. Okay, so we'd love to hear about how you went from literary fiction to that. Because it's different, you know, it's a little bit different. So I, the book that is actually going to be my sophomore novel, I wrote as my MFA thesis. Uh -huh. um, so I think that the, the transition is really that in my MFA program, I learned how I don't want to say how to write but you learn in a way like that's very literary and you learn how to do like all of the setting and all of the the literary side of writing that you know those books do so well for and so um when I was recrafting it and then you know writing my romances I had that backdrop of this really 
literary background. And I was able to take some of that and put that in my books while also kind of taking my creative and commercial side. So you put the literary pieces that you liked and the, you know, you're sort of more, I don't know, commercial is like a weird word to, I mean, these are, they're all just kind of your creative output, you know, it's like yeah. what you think of and what you want to write about and whether or not it's commercial is, is a little arbitrary. It's um, funny though, because like, there do seem to be like when I, um, when I got my like offer, one of the passes I got, the agent said, this is too commercial for me. She wanted something more yeah. literary. And mm -hmm. I do think it's really interesting how, though it is kind of an arbitrary line, it, it still like exists in people's minds. Oh, absolutely. I'm thinking more from the like creators end, yeah. you know, like as you're creating something, you may have some consciousness of, oh, well, this might be a tough sell or not, but, or you might not, you might just be kind of writing what you want to write. And then later on, it's like, well, this is more commercial and this is more literary, but we're sort yeah. of going. Yeah. That's I mean, there, there are definitely different, there are definitely different styles. Um, I'm curious what, what, what has changed about your MFA thesis book um, to get it to where it is now? Because we have all rewritten books. I mean, I have taken complete novels end to end and like redone them. So I think that's something a lot of us can relate to. So my, my sophomore novel, uh, Everything I Thought I Knew is the working title, uh, was my MFA thesis. And it was probably upmarket women's fiction at the time that I wrote it in as my thesis. And as I went to market it, there were things that I walked back. Like when I wrote it as my thesis, it didn't have a happily ever after. So I added that in as I was querying it and, and putting it out there. And as I'm working on it now, there's a lot of having to add in almost like genre expectations for, for a romance. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, they have slightly different beats than you know women's fiction um, and especially I would say upmarket women's fiction so a lot of it is walking back some of maybe the heavier topics and hmm. and uh, hitting the romance beats and working on finding that that voice because my fiction is very voice driven I think as opposed to plot driven although you know they're they're tropes but the, you know it's, it's a lot about voice um so I, I think it was a lot more of that uh, and upping the pacing a little mm -hmm. bit. Yeah, I would definitely awesome. say like the dialogue is is much uh, <laughs> much more fast paced and fun and and, and kind of contemporary. You know, I, I like to reference a lot of pop culture in my books. Um, not so much in, in my second book, but there it's still in there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think that's the biggest difference is kind of taking it from um, maybe a more serious story that had a romance and then turning it into a romance. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense, hitting the, the tropes and the genre norms. I know that a lot of our watchers have considered getting an MFA. Could you talk a little bit about um, what you would recommend people consider if they are thinking about getting one? I mean, I think, I mean, I got my MFA 10, 10 years ago. <laughs> I graduated 10 years ago, um, and I think the programs have evolved a little bit since then, but for me, when and, and I mentioned this before, for me, writing and getting my MFA was about getting to spend time as a writer, like in a writing community, and spending those two years really refining my craft. Mm -hmm. um, so I think when you Think about getting an MFA, you can't think of it as I'm going to get my MFA and it's going to get me published. I think in some ways, a lot of people think that like, oh, I'm going to go get an MFA and then bam, I'm going to be a published writer. I mean, it took me 10 years, like literally like to the day that I was 10 years to the day I was doing my thesis reading is when my debut came out. Wow. That's <laughs> yes. kind of cool. You know, it was not a straight line. There was you know, a lot of that went on in those 10 years. Um, when We're 30 is actually my second book because my first book is now my second book. Mm -hmm. But but yeah, I think people need to think about if they, what they want out of it, right? Do Are they going into it to really like refine their craft and study 
um, are they going into it to be part of kind of like a little writer community for that period of time? Um, because, you know, they do have like low residency programs now. So versus full residency. Um, so I think it's all about where it fits into your life and what you want to get out of it is the most important thing. I think you definitely shouldn't go into it assuming that it's going to help you get published. I'm going to just pull up some of the questions real fast that people had for you. Toby wanted to know which class helped the most from your MFA program when it came to focusing on your writing. I took uh, probably three or four fiction workshops during my MFA. Um, and I think those were probably the, the most important courses that I took in refining my craft because you're critiquing other people and you're getting critiqued yourself. So you're constantly kind of in that writer mode and you really develop the thick skin that you need to go into publishing, right? <laughs> But yeah, I got to study under Victor Laval and Maya Goldberg um, were two of the visiting writers who were there when I was uh, at Adelphi. And I think those classes were just really, really interesting because each teacher brought their own style and own, you know, take on, on fiction. So you got to really dive into your work with different people and kind of parts of that each got pulled into like your style and the things that you learned. Yeah, that's fantastic. Okay, Cesar wanted to know, how would you compare the practical value of your MFA compared to what one can learn through other courses, reading books, that sort of thing? It's kind of a hard question to answer, but I'd love any thoughts you have on it. Oh, that's a hard question. Yeah, I know. I was like, it's hard to measure that out, especially after the fact. Yeah, I mean, because I have one. Um, for me, like I said, an MFA was so much about being in it. You're there for, for two years with your people. You're, you know, writing your thesis and you're constantly getting it critiqued and you have a, a thesis advisor and you have your teachers who are in your program. So in that regard, I think that an MFA helps you because you're in that community and you're kind of never out of it. Like, you know, obviously like I would go home and I had a job and, but you know, twice, three times a week, I was there with those same people and, you know, we were going through it together. So that, that kind of mentality, I think, puts you in a different headspace than just taking one-off courses. Um, but, you know, that's to say I've taken fiction workshops outside of my MFA. Um, I've gone to conferences. I buy craft books, but I very rarely read them for some reason, <laughs> but I have a nice collection behind me. I think there's definitely a benefit to taking an in-person or virtual interactive class as opposed to just trying to read a book and do it yourself because then you don't have anyone to kind of ping what you're doing off of. Yeah, it's a very different experience, I'm sure. Have you ever thought about teaching writing? Because I think some people go into MFA partly to have the credential for teaching. Yes, I, I, I could teach. Um, I took a, a class during my program on teaching. Um, and I have thought about it, particularly at like the high school level, coming in and doing like workshops or like maybe mm -hmm. if there's like a creative writing club. Um, Cause I know for me, like that's when I was becoming a writer, right? I used mm -hmm. to walk around with a, a notebook or a binder everywhere I went and I just wrote all the time, um, you know, wherever I was all day long. Um, how I finished high school with good grades <laughs> when all I was doing was writing. So I think a lot about that because I, I think that's such a great age to really foster it because I don't want to say you're not as distracted uh, from life, but it's different. I think being a writer as a, as a young person mm -hmm. than it is being a writer as an adult. You know, like I said, like I was writing all the time. I didn't go anywhere without a notebook. My best friend and I wrote this like sweeping 500 page YA novel in high school that, that's just never going to see the light of day. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it would be really a great experience. And I know they, they have those types of programs where I live. So I've been kind of waiting to be published to see how I can be part of that. Yeah. So let's move on. So what's happening for you right now? You signed a publishing contract for your sophomore novel. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? We're also really interested in working with the small press and your experience with them. And, and we'd love to hear about the book you just had come out as well. Yeah, sure. 
Um, well, so right now um, I'm kind of in the thick of, of post publication promotion. Mm. Um, so I'm trying to get in front of as many readers as I can. Um, you know, coming from a small press, uh, marketing is on me. Um, fortunately, I work in marketing, so I <laughs> I have a little bit of an advantage over some other people in terms of like knowing how to do some of this this stuff. I'm you know talking with readers, um, just on social media, constantly building my keep building my bookstagram. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what I'm doing now. I did uh, just sign with Red Adapt Publishing for my next book, uh, and there's not much going on. With that right now, I'm just kind of waiting to to get into edits for that, mm -hmm. and then, you know, once that happens, then you know I'll start promoting it and all of this starting kind of all over again. Um, and I'm writing my next book, so that's kind of what I'm doing right now is working on on what will hopefully be my third book. Um, We're big fans of jumping into the next project, <laughs> you know, as a way of, you know. Being productive, but also coping with stress, you know? Yes. And uh, it's actually really funny because I had to stop writing for my book launch, obviously. And my characters, uh, it's enemies to lovers, which is a lot of fun uh, to write because there's like all of this banter, so much banter. <laughs> but I'm at this point where they're mad at each other. And so it's the first point in part of the novel where they're like actually not together and bantering. And so I'm trying to like get back into my book and I'm like, but they're, they're not together. <laughs> How do I get them back together? Back together. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's one of my favorite romance tropes. I'm excited about that. I actually like hadn't really read a lot of enemies to lovers and the ones that I've kind of read, I, I hadn't really been get that much getting into. Um, but it's a lot of fun. So I, I, I've been reading them now and they're like, they're, they're a lot of fun. You have a favorite romance trip? Friends to lovers or, you know, friends to lovers or second chance romance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love like those, you know, first love comes back into your life books. So my second book is, is a second chance romance about a first love. I took that idea of like, you know, all these books about second chance romance, right? So they get back together. So my book that I'm trying to get an agent for is about what happens after. So five years after they get back together, where are they? And mm -hmm. they're falling apart again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, interesting. So what are you like, what are your goals in, in your career going forward? And kind of what are you doing now, like to act on them? So my, my debut came out and I have my second book lined up to hopefully come out next year. Um, and I'm working on another one. I'm also in the process of working on trying to find a, a new agent. So that's really interesting because, you know, I'm doing like book promotion and I'm talking to readers and then I'm getting rejection emails okay. <laughs> from agents. Right, right. Um, actually, the day that I announced my second book deal, I also got a rejection from an agent on a different manuscript. I can't imagine how weird that must have felt to both be like publishing your book and getting a rejection letter. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of fun. I've, I've actually really enjoyed working with a small press. I, I always say at work that I, I like to go in and like, you know, I like to know how everything works. Like I'm the process person. So like, I'll go in and I'll play around in our, you know, content management system so that I know, like, if it's not working, I know how to fix it. Um, or I'll, you know, I'll break one of our templates. So I know how to put it back together and I can show other people. So for a small press, that's kind of like, you're getting a crash course in publishing because you don't have a big team who's just doing things in the background. So you get to be very hands-on. Yeah. I mean, and, and for you, you know, you're, you're, you're doing your editing and you're having input on your cover um, and you really do your own marketing. So I'm out there putting myself out there and building my brand. Um, I'm redesigning my website, which, you know, sent a search party for me because <laughs> I just went down a rabbit hole for a week. But yeah, I mean, I love all of that. It's, you know, it's what I do for work. So yeah, it's, 
it's fun to do it for myself and kind of take all these things that I do for, for this company and do it for myself and, yeah. and help build that. Um, so does it feel like you're coming out of that experience that, you know, working with a small press with sort of more tools and more knowledge about publishing and book promotion as you are seeking, you know, agent representation? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I feel like I'll have a lot to offer, you know, because there's this idea, you know, if you are the big publisher, they do everything for you, but that's not really true anymore. And a lot mm -hmm. of marketing is on authors. So, you know, I'm, I'm out there, I'm, I'm making relationships and I'm networking and I'm connecting with readers. So I think in a way it's, it's been great because I really enjoyed, enjoy getting to do that. Well, to wrap up, if you could just um, throw a little plug out there for your book that just came out, tell us what it's about and tell readers where they can find it and where they can find you on social media or wherever you'd like to share. So my book is called When We're 30. It is a rom-com and it is a marriage of convenience friends to lovers mashup about two friends who follow through on a pact to get married if they're both still single when they turn 30. I love that. And of course, they get married and everything gets complicated, <laughs> as it does in a romance novel. Yeah. I love um, that because I made a pact with a dear friend long ago. I don't remember if we put an age on it, but it was like, let's marry each other. If we don't find anybody else, we'll marry each other. So I love that. Uh -huh. that he, like, I started reading it and I'm like waiting for him to show up on the doorstep. <laughs> Incarnations and everything. I thought were great. Yeah. That's cute. Um, Where could we find you online, Casey? Uh, well, the book is available pretty widely online, anywhere ebooks are sold, and most places where you can buy paperbacks online, it, it's there. So okay. um, I just saw that it was online at Target, which was kind of cool. Oh, that's so cool. <clears throat> that's awesome. Um, you can also like special order it from a bookstore, but it, it, you probably won't see it on, on the shelf there, but you can order it. In terms of social media, I'm on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. Um, I have an Instagram, so I do a lot of book reviews and then writer stuff on my Instagram. That's probably the best place to connect with me because I'm most active there. Okay. Um, I don't quite understand Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> the other way around. But I'm on there. Uh, should you need me? Okay, cool. We'll link your, uh, your handles down below. What's your like number one piece of advice to other writers, just given all your experiences? So I, I always say that I, I learned how to write in the, in the in-between because, uh -huh. um, you know, I went from high school where I was writing constantly, but I was so busy in the high school. Like I was like on, on the newspaper and the literary magazine and I played three varsity sports and I don't, you know, I did everything. I was in the school plays. Um, so I just, you know, I fit it in where I could and where, when I could. And then, you know, in college and grad school, like in grad school, like I said, I was working two jobs. I had an hour commute to school. I used to write at the laundromat. <laughs> I'd like idea. stand at the folding tables and write while, my, while I did my laundry, um, you know, wherever I could. I actually found a notebook. I remember sitting in my car about to go into a job interview. And I wrote what is now the, still the first page of my second novel. That's awesome. <laughs> and I have that notebook. So it actually was a big benefit to me because now, you know, with the full-time job and, and I have a four-year-old and, you know, and a husband and a life, I really, I am able to find the time in between everything else. You know, there are a lot of people who have a lot of trouble writing because they're like, I don't have a big chunk of time, but you know, I can like sit down for a half hour and, and write out 250 words. And, you know, that's fine because I always remind people, if you write a page a day, you'll have a book in a year. Yeah. So, you know, you don't have to sit and write for hours. Yeah. I mean, you and it really... takes practice, you know, I think that and that's kind of what you're saying. Like you've had years of practice. You may not have known you were practicing for <laughs> when you had children, but you kind of have all this practice of fitting in writing in small chunks of time around a lot of other responsibilities, you know, rather than going from kind of, a, I don't know, a life where you had like a lot more 
unbroken chunks of time to sudden toddlerhood when you have yeah. like zero unbroken chunks of time. I, know. I would say that's the one thing that I wish I had done differently when I was like in my twenties mm -hmm. is you have all of this time where, you know, I mean, I guess you don't because you're in college and grad school and you're building your career, but you know, I had all of this time where I could have like gone to writer conferences and retreats and, and I just was like, I can't take off my, my, you know, my job, I have bills to pay. And, you know, because I was at the start of my career and, and you just, you don't think about it and then you don't do it. And then you're like, oh, now I, now I have responsibilities and I can't no, I really... go away for <laughs> Right. Right. Yeah. I've had that same thought. Where I'm like, why did I not do all these things before my daughter was born? Because you seem so busy even then, you know. And it's like that's a lot. Like three hundred dollars back then was like two weeks of work at Starbucks, right? Like, yeah, that's you what know? you don't have back then is the money and the ability to spend time not making money. Yeah, so that makes it a little tricky. But that's great that you got all that practice, and now that you have the, you know, all the competing demands of family and job and and toddler, you feel comfortable kind of getting in enough writing to be productive and satisfied. Yes, I thought about for a while having my tagline be uh, writing by the baby cam light. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. Writing by the light. That could could be go on our next coffee. Glow moment. of the baby cam. <laughs> you know, I, I think I talked about this a little bit in how I wanted to going into an MFA program but you know for me part of why I didn't want to study writing and make it like a thing was because I didn't ever want to resent it mm, yeah. I was like really worried about trying to get published and knowing how hard that was and then resenting this thing that I love that's like such a part of me and so I think just write you know don't worry about the rest of it like there's going to be hard days and there's going to be rejection and, you know, there's going to be success. Just do it for you and the rest will come. <laughs>